so this is the, the last lecture on this, on this course, on this short course on, on canon methods. Uh, and as you may notice, we, we did quite a lot yesterday, and we still have quite a lot to do. So I realize, you know, for those of you who did not know anything about canons before, there were already many things yesterday. Okay, uh, it's hard to get a big picture of what we did, perhaps. Uh, today I will be a bit uh, so. In a sense, we finish the you know general framework, the de description of the math mathematical properties of kernels and and also the the method kernel methods. I think today it will be a bit more, not really applied, but at least more uh, related to applications where we really will try to, uh, to use this framework and these tools in order to, to get closer to solving real problems. And in particular, it will, it will boil down to discussing how to design, how to make, how to study kernels, which is the way where you can put your knowledge in order to solve some data. Okay. Uh, uh, so, so today we'll take some examples in particular related to comput computational biology to, to show you in some practical examples how you can, uh, you can use canon methods to, to solve uh, practical problems. <coughs> so bef before going to these, uh, to these canons, uh, I think I need, uh, it would be good for everybody, uh, if I try to wrap up a bit what we did yesterday and try, uh, perhaps I'll manage, but try to give you like a big picture of uh, what are the kernels and, and to give you at least two different ways uh, to understand what, what is a kernel and therefore to understand what we will do today, which is uh, try to understand in deep, in depth, some kernels. Uh, so, so first, uh, because people are still coming, perhaps I can just start very quickly with, uh, there was a question during the course yesterday which I did not answer very well. I mean, my answer was correct, but I did not, my, uh, I did not explain very well why, why it was correct. So it was the question about the representative theorem. Remember, there was, at some point, I made a proof showing that when you minimize some empirical risk penalized by L2 in a, in a high dimensional space, then you know that the solution lies in a subspace, which is a subspace spanned by the, the points. So the, this result is, is, uh, is called the representative theorem. Uh, and there was a question, if you replace the L2 norm by something else, for example, the L1 norm, uh, does it work the same? Like, is it also true that uh, when you penalize by the L1 norm, empirical risk plus L1 norm, then the solution lives in the subspace spanned by the points. And I said the answer is no, and so it's no because, so the, the main reason is that when you do, you know, the, the, perhaps I can draw it again. The, the main tool I used in my proof at least was that you were in a big space. Here you had a linear subspace. And so what I say is just that if you have a vector beta, which is anywhere in the big space, and when you do its orthogonal projection, okay, so this is beta, and this one I call beta s, so it's the orthogonal projection. I said that when you do L2 regularized learning, then beta s is always better than beta, because they have the same empirical risk. The beta and beta hat, they do the same predictions on the point, so they, there is no difference in loss. But the Euclidean norm of this vector is smaller than this one. And this is quite intuitive, you know, it's, it's easy to prove that when you project, you reduce the size. Now, this is only true for the Euclidean norm, if you take the L1 norm, it's not true anymore than when you project, the L1 norm is smaller. Okay, and just to convince yourself of that, perhaps you can just draw, uh, let me show you an example in two dimensions. Suppose you take a point here. This is a point which has some L1 norm. So the L1 norm is just the sum of the absolute value of the coefficients. Okay, so suppose this point has coordinate, uh, you know, uh, one zero, its L1 norm is one, okay? Now, if you think what are the set of points in this 2D space which have a L1 norm smaller than 1, you may have seen it already, the, the, the L1 norm ball, in fact, is a square in 2D, something like that. Okay? So th this is the set of points which have a L1 norm smaller than this point. Okay? And what I claim is that when you do orthogonal projection of this point into some subspace, then sometimes the L1 norm can increase. So in practice, let's do it. If you, if you project, for example, so imagine that 2D represents the big space, and now I want to draw a subspace, so in, it would be a one-dimensional subspace. Let's take this subspace, for example. Okay, this is a subspace that goes through zero. If I project this point orthogonally to this subspace, I get a beta s here. 
which has, of course, a smaller Euclidean norm. You decrease it. It's always true for the Euclidean norm. You always decrease the, the length. But in terms of L1 norm, you see that you go outside of the ball, meaning that the L1 norm has increased. Okay? So this is what, one example where you can observe that doing a projection does not always decrease the L1 norm, and therefore the proof that we did yesterday, at least, cannot be uh, applied to L1 norms. Okay? So it's not true that when you penalize with something else than L2 norm, the, the solution has to lie there. Okay, that was one thing. Now, uh, now let me try to, uh, again, to, to give a bit uh, a broader picture of what we said yesterday. In particular, at the end, yesterday, I, I talked very quickly of RKHS. Uh, it would be a long, a long story to tell you more about RKHS, so I will not, but I will just try to give you some, some insights of RKHS because we will use them a bit today to understand the kernels. So, in a sense, what, what we did yesterday is that we, we started from, so I will draw on the left this time. We started from some, some space of data, often I call that X. And I said this could be like vectors, but we will work on more general data, which could be images, which could be texts, which could be graphs. So this is a space of data that we want to work on. And here we have points, an object X and an object X prime, for example. And we want to work on these points. So what I, the way I presented kernels yesterday was uh, first in terms of notion of embedding, saying that in order to do machine learning on this space, one thing you can try to do is, is to is to map this space through mapping phi to a vector space. Okay? And this is a vector space, so this means that these are vectors. In particular, x can be mapped to a point phi of x. x prime can be mapped to a point phi of x prime. And, and so the link between the, uh, so what I say is that when you define such a mapping, you define a kernel function k. So k is a function of x and x prime. It lives in this space. And the link between k and phi is that which is embedding the, the kernel k between x and x prime is the inner product in this space between phi of x and phi of x prime. OK, we have this formula. k of x, x prime equals phi of x transpose phi of x prime. So this was the definition of a kernel, very simple definition. And then I mentioned this kernel tree, so these representative there and there. That, that said that, in fact, one, one useful thing about kernels is that in this space, you can learn linear functions. So you can learn, I will draw a line. This is a, function, a linear function. It could be for discrimination. It could be for regression or for whatever. But this is a function f, which, uh, which I, I use the notation f beta, which is a linear function in the space of phi. Okay? And what we said yesterday is that in order to learn a linear function here using some learning algorithm that does minimization of some empirical risk plus L2 organization. So if I want to, to solve something like minimization in beta of some risk, Rn of F, F beta. So the risk only depends on, you know, for this line, you, would, you look at the prediction of F beta over the endpoints. This is the empirical risk plus a penalty of the form lambda times the square norm of beta. What we said yesterday is that in order to solve this thing, so this is a problem in beta, so it looks like you live in this space, but to solve this, you just need to use the kernel k. This was the representative theorem, and you can compute the, the solution of this in terms of function only through the kernel. So it was the first kernel tree saying that you can work in this space, but this space could be very large, etc. You don't really need to compute phi of x, phi of x prime, you can directly learn your function as soon as you have the kernel. That was the, the, the first part of the lecture yesterday about uh, the link between learning a linear function and making a kernel. Now, yesterday, I, I, towards the end, I also mentioned that uh, when you look at this, you could then ask the question, so we have a function k over this space, which is associated to some embedding that allows us to do that. Can we characterize the set of functions k that are valid kernel in the sense that they, they indeed correspond to some inner product through this formula. And then we made this analysis and we showed in particular that if you have, so if k has this property, then we, 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 we prove that it means that it implies that k is positive definite. So this is, 
a kind of technical property we will not really use today, so I will not come back uh, to that, but uh, it was a property. And in fact, we also very quickly mentioned the reverse, meaning that if k is a positive definite function, then it is an inner product. So this is a very strong equivalence. One direction is obvious to show. The converse is a bit complicated to show. And to prove the converse, in fact, we, we mentioned one tool that will be instrumental in understanding canon, which is the RKHS. So, in fact, this is why I wanted to, to plot it on the same picture. What we said is that being positive definite, which is a technical thing, is equivalent to having an RKHS. And here, RKHS, I just mentioned the word yesterday without really saying what it is. In fact, an RKHS is also a vector space. So it's a bit like this, okay? But it's a particular one, so to each kernel K, which is positive infinite, there is a unique space called the RKHS, which is a vector space, and which is useful for two things. The first one is that it's useful to prove this equivalence here, because this is a vector space where we can embed x uh, uh, to the space such that the inner product is the kernel. So in fact, this is a vector space where we have a mapping that goes from x to something that, in fact, is a vector which we call kx. Okay, in the, in the slides, if you go back to the slides, you will see sometimes kx. kx is an element of the space that is associated to x. You can have a kx prime here. And so these are vectors. And it turns out that when you start from a, from a kernel and you build its RKHS, and you define kx and kx prime, then the inner product between kx and kx prime is precisely the kernel. Okay, so the, this was uh, the reason why we did that. It was in order to prove that when you start from a positive kernel, then you can systematically create a space here, which is a Hilbert space, or so it's a vector space like that, in such a way that you can embed x to this Hilbert space and have the inner product realized as the kernel. So this shows that being positive definite implies that you, are, you, are, you have an inner product. Now, this is a bit technical, and perhaps you don't need really to, to think too much about that, but something that's important is to look a bit at this space. So this is a particular space of objects, and in fact, in the, the objects here are functions. So if you take a point in this space, I should, instead of calling it kx and kx prime, perhaps I should call it f. Because the, the points in this space are, are functions that go from x to r. Okay, so in fact, this is a Hilbert space of functions. So to, to any, if you give me a kernel, a function k, which is positive definite, I can uniquely associate to it a space of functions. And the functions are functions that, that go from x to r. So here you may think, well, here we also add a function from x to r, because here when we embed x to a, to a vector space, we said they are linear functions, okay? In particular, f beta of x, we can look at the set of linear functions in this space. These are functions, so this is f beta is a function from x to r, from x to r, okay? So you may wonder, is there a link between these functions here that, that are the functions we want to learn? So here at the end, we will learn linear functions over this space. Is there a link between these functions and this space here? Because here, this is a space of functions. I did not insist how we, we make it, but believe me, it's possible to, to systematically make it, the RKHS. And in fact, there is a link, and a very clear link, which is that the functions in the RKHS are exactly the linear functions in this space. Okay, so each function in this space corresponds to one linear function in this space. Meaning, almost, I could write f beta. I don't want to write f beta because the beta is a vector that only lives here. Okay, but in terms of function, it's the same. So if you look in detail, in the slides that we skipped, you can, you can see the construction of the RKHS, and you can convince yourself that the RKHS is a set of functions which are exactly the linear functions over which we want to learn. Remember, at the end, we want to learn over a set of functions, and I said, when we do empirical experimentation, we define a set of functions. These are the linear functions over some representation, and these are exactly the guys which are in the RKHS. Okay? There is a second important thing, which is that not only the the, the, the elements of this space, so the, the functions of the RKHS are the linear function, but 
In addition, th this is a space, this is a, a Hilbert space. So this is a space where you have some inner product and you also have some norms, for example. And it turns out that there is what's called an isometry between this space and that one. In the sense that in this space, if you look at the norm, so I said that this function, for example, this function f may be the same as this function f. Okay, so there is a one-to-one -one mapping between these functions and these functions. And in terms of norm, it turns out that, this is important, the, the norm of this function, so let's, let's call it f beta. Okay, uh, I said that f beta is a function if it's this kind of function. Then the norm of this function in this space, so let's call that, usually we call that hk, the RKHS associated to the kernel k. So the norm of, the, of f in hk, in fact, is equal to the norm of beta in this space. So here I just call that the L2 norm, okay? So it's just the L2 norm of beta. So again, it's not trivial, uh, just believe me, you can check it in the slides. But this RKHS is something that exists and that is made of functions which are exactly the kind of functions we want to learn. So for example, here, now, if you look at, at learning that we want to do, yesterday I insisted on the fact that we learn linear functions with L2 regularization. Now, this thing can be re-expressed exactly in the same way by saying that we learn a linear function, so this thing is an element of the RKHS. So we want to learn a function, an element of the RKHS. And to learn it, we, we need to minimize the empirical risk, so it's a property of the, of the function itself, so it's, it's depends on how, what are the predictions made by the function on the training points. And it's penalized by the L2 norm of beta. Okay, but because of this isometry, you see that the L2 norm of beta is also the, the L2 norm of F in this space. So this means that we can reinterpret learning a linear model here as really learning a function over a space. And, and the reinterpretation is really to write that uh, so this thing, perhaps, is equivalent to, to minimizing when f is a function of the RKHS, the risk, empirical risk of f, plus lambda times the norm of f in the RKHS. So, uh, I wanted to make a clear picture. I realize it's not very clear anymore, but there are all these links, okay? And, and the ta one take home message here is that, again, yesterday I really started from standard linear algebra, what we know how to do in linear regression in low dimension. So this is usually the interpretation we give. We say we learn linear function with L2 regularization, then it's related to SVM, to large margin class failures, et cetera. But all these things, you can reinterpret them exactly as finding a function living in a space, which is called the RKHS, that fits the data, so the, the fitting term, the risk is always the same, you know, it says that among all functions, let's look for one that separates the point or that fits the point as well as possible. But then what's important is that the L2 norm of beta, which here is a geometric concept, you know, it's the Euclidean distance between the points, etc., now becomes a property of the function itself, okay? So why is it important? It's important and it's gonna be important today because now we will study how to, how to understand or how to make kernels. And on this picture, you know, there are different, uh, different ways to, to understand a kernel that can be useful. So one of them is to say that when I define a kernel, I can see it geometrically as some embedding. And, and therefore, if I, if I want to make a new kernel for some data, one way to proceed would be to say, well, I know that for this data, these features should be important. So you, you can design features, and then when you design features, you may design embedding, and you can deduce a kernel. So in this view, in, you know, on the, on the left, it's like the geometric view. Sorry. Geometric view, and, and the motivations to make a kernel here would be which features do you want in your feature space? Like, you know, this is standard in, in statistical machine learning. If you want to make machine learning, you need to define features. So you can make a kernel from features. You can say, these are the features I want. Then I deduce a kernel as the inner product, okay? 
a related concept here is that because you make a geometry, you cannot focus on features themselves, but you can say, well, perhaps making a feature, because it's an embedding, defines a notion of distance or similarity. There was a question yesterday about is a kernel a similarity? So to some extent it is, because associated to a kernel is an embedding of your data to some space. So you could say, I know that these points, I want them to be close to each other, or these points, I want them to be far from each other. So this would be a way also to define a kernel based on some notions of, let's call that similarity, or distance. Okay, so here what I write is just how you could try to think of how to make a kernel or how to understand a kernel. A kernel on the left is associated to some embedding of your points in some space where you will learn a linear function. So you can think of it in terms of features or in terms of distances. Now the right picture here tells you a different story. It tells you that to choose a kernel, you could also just look at this equation and say that when you define a kernel, you define a set of functions, which is your KHS, and a penalty over the functions. And so here you don't clearly see any features. You know, this, this, this line just says that when you will do learning, you will estimate a function and you penalize a function by something which is a property of the function. Okay? So in order to make a kernel, you could also say, well, perhaps I can start from this equation and use some prior knowledge to say that the kind of functions I want to learn, for example, are smooth function over some continuous space, or are, you know, have different properties of often of regularity. And sometimes, we will see many examples, it's possible to design a penalty over the functions that then it corresponds to a kernel, and then when you will use this kernel, you will not think of it in terms of features or in terms of distances, but you will directly think of it in terms of how it regularizes the function that you learn. Okay, because this thing tells you, I want to find a function that fits the point, but that, that has a small L2 norm, so this, the, the, the choice of the L2 norm here is really the, the conditions you impose on the functions. Okay, uh, so this is the, 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 the big picture, uh, which is a bit fuzzy, so now we, I just take several examples, uh, and hopefully uh, each example, so it means that, for example, each kernel, you can try to interpret it in terms of features, in terms of distances, in terms of functional uh, regularization. And sometimes, you know, depending on a kernel, it's, uh, it's easier to understand what it does, either through the features or through the, the penalty it, it, uh, it creates. Okay, so, uh, so again, uh, this is, uh, uh, yesterday I was very quick on the, on the right part. If you want to see the details of Arcash, et cetera, it's partly in the slides uh, to, to make sure I, uh, I mean, if you're interested, you can, you can look at that. Okay, so now let's, uh, let, let's go back to uh, having this picture in mind. Let's, let's go back to, uh, so let's go to some kernel examples and how to make kernels and also how to, we will see that when you have many kernels, you may want to choose a kernel. So I will not have much time to go to many details in all kernels, but at least try to give you some overview of some ideas that you can use to listen kernels. And oh, by the way, I forgot to say, so I discussed with some of you yesterday, there is also another, on this big picture, there is another big part which I didn't draw, which is that these, all these things are also equivalent to being a covariance function, okay, a function k, is an inner product if and only if it is positive definite, if and only if, and only if it is a replacing kernel, if and only if it is a covariance function of a Gaussian process. So for all of you who've heard of and work on, on Gaussian processes, you can add some further equivalence saying that K is a covariance of a Gaussian process. And this is also a useful way to understand the kernel sometimes to say that if you use a kernel, then implicitly you define a Gaussian process. So you may motivate your kernel by some notions of covariance but I will not talk about that uh, today. Okay, so in fact, there are many, many, there are many kernels, okay? And here is a, a short list, for example, of popular or less popular kernels. Uh, so when I said these are kernels, this means that all these functions, k of x, x prime, so these are just for, uh, here, okay, these are for vectors or even just for numbers, positive numbers here. All these functions turned out to be positive definite or reproducing kernel or inner products. Okay, 
Now, something we will start to investigate is, uh, so suppose you have, you know, you want to solve a problem. Uh, typically, you, you run a SVM or rich regression, then you have to choose a kernel. So which one should you choose between this one, this one, this one, and this one? Uh, at first sight, you know, it seems that you have the choice, so you could just uh, think in terms of trying them and looking at, at the, the best one in terms of prediction. Or what we'll try to do is try to understand what you do when you use these kernels. So how do you understand these kernels? Well, typically, uh, I think in, in these cases, there are different ways to understand the kernels. So first of all, it's not obvious at all that these are kernels. You know, being a kernel means that these are positive definite. So sometimes the first one we saw already is the polynomial kernel. So to show that this is a kernel, if you remember, we, we can prove it by expanding the, the product into uh, many terms, and then each term is some, is some product. So you, the, the, first, the first one is an inner product in some kind of high dimensional space. Okay, so you can, you can prove that the polynomial kernel is a kernel using the, showing that it's directly an inner product. Now, for example, if you look at the, at, at the mean kernel here, so if you take two numbers, uh, x and x prime, these are uh, non-negative numbers, for example, seven and nine, then you pick the smallest of the two, seven, okay? This is a valid kernel, okay? So it seems to be a, an easy operation, you know, given two numbers to take the, the smallest one. It turns out that uh, this is a kernel, meaning that it's an inner product. And so it's a nice example of this kernel trick, which says that sometimes the kernel is easy to compute, whereas the inner product would be difficult to compute. In fact, the, the mean kernel is an inner product, but if you want it to represent phi of x, such that the mean is the inner product between phi of x and phi of x prime, then phi of x and phi of x prime have to be infinite dimensional. Okay, so this is really an example where taking the mean of two numbers is obvious. Seven and nine is seven. If you want to write it as inner product, and if you want you know, to draw the feature space where the mean is the inner product, you need infinite dimensions. Okay, it's not a finite dimensional uh, embedding here. So by the way, uh, so I suppose there are some experts that don't need to answer, but for those of you who are not familiar with, with kernels, uh, can you see why the mean kernel is positive definite? Anybody has, has a way to prove? If I, so this is an exercise in this case. So for example, uh, all these kernels I claim are positive definite. So it means in particular so that all these kernels, you can write them as inner products, okay? So does anybody see a way to, to write the minimum of two numbers as some inner product between phi of x and phi of x prime, meaning that what would be a good space and what would be a good embedding to represent, an, so here this would be real numbers, like here you have seven, nine, you want to have phi of seven, phi of nine, such that the inner product between phi of seven and phi of nine is equal to seven. Anybody has an idea of how to to realize this embedding, which would prove that it's positive definite. So it's an exercise, you, you, you should, uh, if I have to grade uh, this, uh, <laughs> this course, this would be uh, the, the, the way to get a, a rank. Okay, uh, let, let me, so in fact, so w one thing I didn't say clearly is that there is not a unique way to represent a kernel. In fact, uh, it's easy to, sh to, to show mathematically that there are as soon as you can embed your data here, there are often an infinite number of ways to represent a kernel as inner product. Okay, meaning there are many different Hilbert spaces such that the inner product is your kernel. So this is, this is true for the mean. So there are many ways to represent the mean as, a, as inner product. So for example, I'm sure some of you are doing uh, Gaussian processes or random processes, okay? so. The mean of, of two numbers, uh, does anybody know if it's related to a covariance? Yes, it's, it's a random Yeah, it's almost, yeah, almost a random walk. So it's called the Brownian motion. So if you've ever heard of the Brownian motion, the Brownian motion is a stochastic process. I will not detail what's a stochastic process, but think of it as a random walk, continuous over time. And so the, 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 the Brownian motion, Let's call that B, uh, BS, S, so, or BT, usually, BT. Uh, you can think of it as a, you know, you may have seen pictures if you, if you do finance or whatever. This is a random process, so this is a kind of 
you can think of it in, this is a Gaussian process is why I'm asking, okay? So you can think of it in terms of uh, a realization is, is this kind of stuff. And mathematically, it's a random process, meaning that in particular, if you fix two horizons, S and T, okay? Then the, the value here is a random variable. So the value, in fact, the value at S is a, is a normal, is a, is a Gaussian distribution with variance S. If you just look at time t, it's the same. It's a Gaussian distribution at, at time t. And for those of you who have heard of the Brownian motion, one fundamental property is that the covariance between the Brownian at time s and at time t is equal to the mean of s and t. Okay, so if you've never seen that before, sorry, uh, it's not very clear, but if you've heard of it, uh, then you know that the covariance between bt and bs is in fact the mean of st. Okay, so if I talk of covariance, this seems to be related to the direction I did not show here, that is that the, the positive definite functions are covariance functions. But what, how does that relate to inner product? Well, one relation is that a covariance is exactly an inner product in some space. Because what is the covariance? You know, remember in terms of uh, basic probability? Remember that the, the covariance, so the, the, the covariance between BS and BT, two random variables, this is the expectation of their product, right? E of BS, BT. When I, when I write the expectation of BS, BT, these are two random variables, you can explicitly write it as some inner product because this means that you have two random variables work, you know, living in a probabilistic space. So this thing is like the integral this is the average, so this is the integral of something that often we write uh, bs of omega, so omega would be the, you know, the probabilistic uh, variable, bs of omega, bt of omega, according to some probability, which, which is the, the, the measure that defines the random variable, so let's call that uh, dp of omega, okay? And so this thing is really what's called an inner product, because this is exactly the inner product in a space, which is the space of squared integrable functions, so it's in what's called L2 of, uh, of dp. So it means that you, you live in a probability space, you look at the set of random variables, in fact a random variable lives in a Hilbert space, okay, the space of squared integrable function, and this is the inner product between the function bs of omega and bt of omega. Okay, so it's a bit uh, perhaps complicated math, but uh, at the end, what I've, what I've said is that for some people here, perhaps the mean is really associated to the Brownian motion because we know it's a covariance of two Brownian motions. And as soon as you say it's a covariance, you could say, well, we can do Gaussian processes with it. But it also means that this is a particular way to write an inner product because the covariance is really a, an inner product. So it means that here your space would be the space of square integrable functions and the definition of your inner product is, is this inner product, so it's the expectation of the product. Okay, it's, it's what's called co covariance. So covariance itself is one way to represent the, uh, the inner product. Okay, so, so perhaps it was, uh, it was a bit uh, abstract, so let, let me show you one other way to write the mean as some inner product which is more visual. So the other way is, uh, is quite direct. So the question is, how, how can I embed some numbers like seven and nine in a Hebert space so that the inner product is the mean? Well, let's look at this embedding where, you know, uh, to, to each number x, so to each number x, I associate a function, sorry, this is not very easy to see perhaps. So to each number x, I associate an interval, which is the interval between zero and x, with value one. Okay, so this means you give me a number, and I represent it, so this will be my, my, my mapping phi. I represent a number by this shape here. Okay, this rectangle of size one x. Okay, this is a mapping from the set of real numbers. So these are real numbers, and I will just look at positive numbers. 
to the set of rectangles here. And in fact, this rectangle, I, I see it as a function. This is the indicator function. So this is the indicator function of the interval 0 x. OK, and so this object here, in particular, it lives in a space, which is a, a, a Hilbert space, of what's called L2 of R, so the space of functions with, with finite square integral. OK? So if you do this mapping, then look at the, if this is x, then if you take another x prime here, another number, you would represent it by some other rectangle, like suppose this is x prime here. OK? And then when you do the, so you have represented x by this shape, x prime by this shape. And now when, when you make the inner product over the space L2 between phi of x and phi of x prime, what do you get? Well, remember the inner product in L2, so phi of x times phi of x prime in L2 is simply equal to the integral of the indicator of 0x of t times the indicator of 0x prime of t dt. This would be the inner product I consider in this space. Okay? And so you see here that you need to make the inner product between these two indicator functions. So you need to multiply the two indicators. And it turns out that the product of the two functions is just the indicator of the, of the smallest one. Of the mean, like here, x is smaller than x prime. So when you multiply one by one, and here one by zero, you get just the indicator function of the smaller interval. So this thing is just equal to the mean of x x prime. Okay. So this is a way to uh, to prove. Again, this shows that there is not a unique way to write a kernel as inner product. And here, for the same kernel, so for the mean. I wrote it either as some inner product in the space of, of squared integrable random variables, or here it's just a geometric drawing as some inner, inner product in a space where I represent a number by a rectangle. And for me, the, the inner product between two rectangles is just the, the integral of that product. OK, so, uh, so this shows that, uh, at least for the mean kernel, so you see, again, the, the mean kernel seems to be a very simple operation, but uh, its RKHS is not so simple. In particular, this is, not, uh, this is infinite dimensional. So now, uh, so I, will, I will perhaps uh, continue just a little bit with the mean kernel, because here the mean kernel, I insisted how you can write the mean as some inner product. So in a sense, I try to insist on the geometric approach. But this is not very enlightening. I mean, once you know that, or once you know that, did you understand why it could be useful or not to use the mean kernel? It's not obvious. Like, from this picture, we know that if we use the mean kernel, then we learn a linear function in this space here. But then it's not obvious, I mean, to me, that uh, it's a good idea, for example, to work in this feature space, uh, because uh, there is no, you know, no clear motivation to work in this space. So therefore, perhaps, uh, and let's do it for the mean kernel, we can instead think of it in terms of, of regularization and say that if we learn with a mean kernel, then we will learn a function you know, over the, the, the real numbers. Can we try to characterize what would be the penalty over the function that we define with the mean kernel? So this would be like a, a complementary way to understand the kernel. And in fact, in this case, there is a very clear and I think simple way to understand the mean kernel. Uh, which is here, so uh, skipping, uh, skipping the technical details, the, the message here is that if you use the, the mean kernel, so you know, the mean between two numbers is a kernel, you can use it, and if you use it to learn a function, then you will, you will learn a function by, again, minimizing empirical risk penalized by something about the function, okay? And in the case of the mean kernel, the penalty here as a meaning, because the penalty is just the L2 norm of the derivative of f. Okay, it's called in statistics uh, or function analysis, it's called the Sobolev norm. So it means that probably this is the best way to understand what you do with the mean kernel. When you do the mean kernel, you have data, okay, and you try to fit the data, but you have to say, don't fit too well the data. So fitting the data is this term, it doesn't change. 
using the mean canon is that you try to feed the data and you regularize your function. And the way you regularize it is by penalizing the norm of its derivative. And here it's just a L2 norm, so it's really the integral of the squared of f prime of u. Okay, so I, you can write it as the L2 norm of f prime. But this L2 norm of f prime is exactly this RKHS norm associated to the mean kernel. Okay, so, so it means that typically you would like to use that if you have some prior knowledge that you know you want to infer a function, you have observations and you want to learn a function, and for some reason you decide that a good function should be a function where the derivative is not too large in the sense of the L2 norm. Therefore, it makes sense to use the mean kernel. But you see here that you know, it's, it's really not clear from the beginning when you start just from the mean kernel, like the mean of two numbers, again, seven and nine, seven. It's not crystal clear that it has these properties. It's just a mathematical consequence. It's not complicated to, to prove. It's in the slides. I will not do it, but you can check the proof. But you see there is a non-trivial link between the shape of the kernel itself, so the, the k of x is prime. Here is the mean, okay? And its properties in terms of regularization, which in this, in this case are more appealing. Like here, for some reason, for some of you, it could make sense to say, I want to regularize by penalizing the, 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 the norm of the derivative. I don't want to, to increase too fast or to, to decrease too fast. Then it's hidden in the derivative. And if you want to use this penalty, then the corresponding kernel is the mean kernel. OK, so this is why I insisted that there, is, there are these two, two views. For the mean kernel, it's better to, to think of it in this way, saying that using the mean kernel can be understood as, as a nice penalty. It's a sobol f norm on f. So you learn a function that will have small derivatives. It's not very uh, useful to look at this. I mean, it's useful to look at this to understand its policy definite. But here, it's not clear what you do when you learn a linear function with L2 regularization in this space here. OK? So, uh, so let's look at some other ones, and I will go a, a bit faster now. So the, this was the mean kernel, and by the way, so the mean kernel uh, seems to be a bit trivial, but it's, it's quite used, and in particular, when you have two data which are not only numbers, but like histograms, you know, sometimes it's possible to summarize some information on some data, like when you have images, you can look at histograms of colors, etc. And when you want to compare two histograms, it's not stupid to, you know, so histograms are like positive numbers over beans. It's not stupid to compare the two histograms by making the sum of the means over the beans. So it would be a sum of mean kernel. It has found to be quite successful in terms of performance for image classification, etc. And even though the, the formula seems a bit naive, in fact, it, it really makes sense because when you do that, you can really write what you do. And when you work on histograms, it means that you learn a function of histograms with smooth derivatives. So it's not completely stupid at all. And it works quite well. OK, so let's look at some other ones. So probably the, the, the most famous kernel in, so in, in, the, in the kernel community, we call that the Gaussian RBF kernel. It has different names in, in other uh, communities. But uh, it's just the Gaussian function applied to x and x prime. This one, too, uh, is positive definite. OK, so, so for this one, uh, uh, and also another one called the Laplace kernel, the good way to understand not only why they are positive definite, but why you may want to use them is, again, to look at them in terms of how they regularize a function. So to these functions, they are positive definite. You could write them as inner product. You know, I could give you examples of similar things, uh, which are not very uh, helpful to understand why you should use them. Uh, for these cases, it's better to look at them in terms of, of a regularization. And in fact, there is, so you notice that the, the, the Gaussian kernel or the Laplace kernel, they all de only depend of on x and x prime through the difference, x minus x prime. So these are called translation invariant kernels, because when you compare x and x prime, if you, if you translate x and x prime, the kernel doesn't change. Okay? In fact, there is a general theory about translation invariant kernels, and even more general notion of translation invariance, but I will just mention um, uh, some result associated to it, which is that, sorry, you see, I have to keep it, yeah, this kind of thing. So when you want to study a kernel k, which is translation invariant, so a function k, which is just a function, there is, sorry, uh, it's a kappa here. So a function k of, x, of xy, which is a, a kappa of x minus y, uh, then we know quite well how 
so first, which functions kappa lead to positive definite kernels? And once we have kappa, we know quite well what is the DRKHS associated to the function. So what is the penalty that they induce? Okay? So first, what are the positive definite functions? There is this Borner theorem that tells that a function k translation invariant is, is a valid kernel if and only if kappa, so kappa is a function at the Gaussian function, is what's called the Fourier transform of some positive measure. There are a few technical terms, forget about them, but the, the, key, the, key, the key result here is that you, you probably have heard of Fourier transforms, so you have functions uh, that have Fourier transforms. Here we need to talk of Fourier transforms of, of measures. It's a bit more general than standard functions, but it's quite uh, standard. But the important result here is that it has to be the Fourier transform of, of a positive measure. Okay, and therefore as soon as you give me a positive, so finite, symmetric, and positive measure, you take its Fourier transform to obtain a kappa, and you get a valid kernel, translation invariant kernel. And it's an if and only if uh, condition, meaning that uh, all the positive definite functions, which are translation invariant, are Fourier transform of symmetric, finite, and uh, positive uh, measures. Okay, so that's just a characterization, but what we're interested in in order to understand them is also to, to say, well, can we know what is, uh, what is the regularization induced by this kernel? And in this case, we know what it is, so it's a bit uh, ugly to look at, but basically if we just look at this equation here, this tells us that if we use a translation invariant kernel, K, associated to a kappa, so kappa would be the Gaussian, for example, then the, the norm in the RKHS, so the, the norm here, which is this one, so the norm that we would use to learn a function, can be expressed as some integral. What you have to look at here is that this is a, there is a f hat here. So this is a norm that depends on the Fourier transform of f. Okay, so when you regularize a function f, you have to look at f in the Fourier domain, meaning that for, uh, f has to have a, a Fourier transform. And then in a Fourier domain, you see that it's a kind of L2 norm in the Fourier do domain, but you divide the Fourier transform of f by the Fourier transform of kappa, which is your kernel. Okay, meaning that choosing different kernels amounts to penalizing differently the Fourier transform at different frequencies. So intuitively, the kind of thing you can do with translation invariant kernel is uh, when you want to run a function and you want it, for example, to be smooth, and for you the notion of smoothness can be expressed in terms of the Fourier, Fourier transform. So you know, when you have a function, you look at it in the Fourier domain, it's expressed in terms of frequencies, so it can have different energies at different frequencies if it varies a lot or not. And here you penalize the energy at different frequencies through your kernel. So for example, choosing a kernel, meaning choosing a function kappa here, could be done based on what you want to penalize. Like if your assumption is that you want to run a function where you know there is no energy at high frequency, then you can completely penalize that with a particular kernel. Okay, so this is a generic result. Now let's look at, uh, at what, it, what it does uh, with particular choice of, of kappa. Yeah, question? Sorry. Uh, can you explain what's the interpretation of uh, the L2 norm of a function? Um, what does it mean for a function to have an L2 norm? What, what exactly is the norm of a function? The L2 norm of, just the L2 norm of a function? Well, the L2 norm is just the integral of the... Of the uh, so. The, so for a function with, which has the L2 norm, the, the, the definition, of course, of the L2 norm, L2, this is just the integral of F square. Okay, according to some measure. So this is why here I talk of L2 according to the measure P, but uh, here we talk of the Lebesgue measure. So it's just uh, F square of T dt. Okay, so the simple picture is you, you have a function, and the L2 norm is, is just, uh, you know, the total the sum of what's non-zero. Okay, so, so let's look at the Gaussian kernel. So again, I claim that the, the Gaussian kernel is a positive definite kernel. To prove it, the simplest, if you, if you accept Borner theorem, to prove it, you just need to check that the Gaussian is the Fourier transform of, the, of a positive measure. And in fact, it is because you may know that the Fourier transform of a Gaussian is a Gaussian. Okay, and so the, the, the inverse Fourier transform of a Gaussian is a Gaussian too. And therefore, because a Gaussian is, is non-negative and it's finite, then 
This proves that the Gaussian kernel is positively definite. Okay? Now, more importantly, what it also shows is that this is the norm in the RKHS. Uh, so this is the penalty you use when you use a Gaussian kernel. So you need to think twice uh, you know, to fully understand what it does. But you see that here is the generic formula. So you, uh, the, the, the norm of f is related to the norm of its Fourier transform. So to if you take a function f, you do its Fourier transform. Then it has some energy at different frequencies. And here, to say whether the norm is large or not, you, you need to, to do the integral over the, the frequencies. So omega is the frequency, from low frequency to high frequency. And you see that you take the Fourier transform of f multiplied by the exponential of the frequency. So this term here goes very fast to infinity. Okay, the exponential of omega square is a very uh, quickly, uh, is a function that goes quickly, uh, quickly uh, to very large numbers. And so if you want this thing to be small, like you know, here we're looking for a function f that would fit the data with a small L2 norm in the RKHS, this means that you want this thing to be small. Okay, and so this means that the Fourier transform of f has to decrease very quickly to zero. Because when you multiply it by an exponential, it has to converge into a small number. So if you're used to, to these you know, functional spaces, etc., then you may know that a function f whose Fourier transform decreases exponentially to zero is exactly a function f which is infinitely differentiable. It's not, not obvious, but it's a, it's a fact, OK? So this means that the set of functions over which you work with the Gaussian kernel are infinitely differentiable functions which is uh, not all functions. You know, you will never learn a, a non-continuous function, for example, with the Gaussian kernel. And, and moreover, you, you get the intuition that uh, what, what's penalized with the Gaussian kernel is really functions which not only are infinitely differentiable, but which, which have energies at high frequencies, because as soon as f hat of omega is not very close to zero for some large values of omega, then this becomes very large because of the exponential. Okay, so Gaussian kernel is associated to a space of functions with, with an infinite number of, of uh, derivatives, and the L2 norm, so the, the, the norm here, uh, is related to the, in fact, it's related to the sum of the L2 norm of the derivatives. Okay, but, okay, I will not go further, but this is the, the correct way to understand what you do with the Gaussian kernel. So you see, this is quite different from the mean kernel. The mean kernel was just about the first derivative. It was about learning a function by penalizing the L2 norm of the first derivative. Here, the Gaussian kernel uh, allows you to learn much more smooth functions. It's not just the first derivative. It has to have two, three, four, all derivatives, and all have to be quite controlled. Interestingly, if you look at something that looks quite similar, you know, in terms of function, the Laplace kernel is just the exponential of minus, the, the, not the square, but the difference between x and y. Then again, it's a translation invariant kernel, so you can again play the trick of writing it as the Fourier transform of a measure. In this case, this is the measure whose Fourier transform is the Laplace kernel. And therefore, you also have a characterization of, this, of the penalty induced by the Laplace kernel. And here, even though you know, by far, this looks a bit like the Gaussian kernel. There is just a square or not a square in the exponential. So, you know, it may look a bit similar. In fact, the norm is very different because here, there is no exponential of omega square anymore. There is just some, the, so it's the Fourier transform of f penalized by omega square. And so these are, in fact, these are just uh, functions with uh, one derivative. So these are not infinite, infinitely differentiable functions. This is a space of functions that, uh, that are C1, uh, whose derivative is in, is in L2, in fact. So you can characterize it. And the take-home message is that this is a space of functions which is much less smooth than the Gaussian kernel. And in fact, the, the penalty you use in this case is just related to the norm of f and the norm of its derivative. So this guy is quite similar to the mean kernel, in fact, in terms of functional properties. Okay? So this is a bit counterintuitive. The kernel looks like the Gaussian kernel up to a square. But in terms of using it, it's, very, uh, it's much closer to the mean kernel than to the Gaussian kernel, because it works on similar spaces of functions and penalizes the, si the same kind of thing related to the, to the first derivative only. Uh, finally, a last example is uh, also a kernel that, you know, if I gave it to you for the first time, you would probably not know why first, why it's positively definite, and second, why you should use it. So it's called the sinus cardinal. So it's the sinus of x minus y divided by x minus y. 
Turns out that as a function of x, y, this is positively definite. And the reason why it's positively definite is that this thing is exactly the Fourier transform of a simple function, which is the indicator function uh, of the interval minus omega omega. OK, so it's like a thing you may have seen in uh, electrical engineering. If you did some, uh, these are called low-pass filtering. So this is the Fourier tra transform of a low-pass filter. And, and for us, what it means is that if you use this kernel, so you have two points x and y, you use this kernel, you plug that into a SVM or rich regression, you will learn a function. What can you say about the function? Well, what you can say is that because you can characterize the Fourier transform of the kernel, then you know that the penalty of f, so you know what is the space of functions over which you work, and you know what is the L2 norm of f. And in this case, you can show that uh, you will learn a function that has no energy at frequency higher than omega. Omega is the, the parameter here. So it's a way to learn uh, very strictly a function which is smooth in the sense that in the Fourier domain, its Fourier transform is restricted to the interval minus omega omega. Okay, it's a kind of low-pass low filtering. So you, you, you are sure that if you use this kernel, the function you will learn uh, has a Fourier transform limited to a smaller domain. Okay, and then once you are in this space, the, the penalty itself is just the L2 norm of f in the sense of the standard L2 norm. Okay, so it may be useful or not, but this is just a way to say I want to learn a function and my prior assumption is that it has to be a function with a Fourier transform restricted to a domain, then you would use the sinus cardinal kernel. Okay, so uh, I gave all these examples because these are real examples where uh, I mean, at least to me, when you just look at the expression of the kernel, it's really not obvious why you would use this kernel. And the good way to understand why you would use them is really to look at what they induce as learning. And here they, they, they allow you to learn functions with different properties. And in most cases, you see these are related to smoothness. So it could be measuring the, the derivatives or measuring the Fourier transforms, etc. It may be more or less adapted to different problems. but uh, at the end, this gives you a tool that if, for some reason, you have a particular penalty in mind, then it may be possible to deduce the kernel that induces this penalty. And then you just plug the kernel in your SVM, and the SVM or your rich regression will learn a function with this penalty. Um, are these, all, all these analyses there for periodic kernels as well? Periodic kernels? Yeah. Uh, periodic kernels. Uh, what is a parody kernel then? It's a, uh, I have to think about it. So what, what is sure is that all these analyses uh, for, so for translation invariant kernel is, uh, can be extended to the notion of semi-group kernels. So this is the case where the, 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 the kernel is not a function of x minus y, but of x composed to with some composition with y. OK? Where, uh, so in fact, uh, this kind of thing, OK? So uh, I'm not sure the periodic kernel have this property, but it could be the case. Like, so for example, if you want to study the kernel x of, of x plus y, then I can do the same story. Okay, it's not the Borner theorem, there is an equivalent. Uh, but I can study all the kernels, k of x plus y. And uh, for that, we need to study the algebraic structure of the, of the semigroup uh, x plus y, uh, et cetera. OK, it becomes a bit too complicated, probably, so I will not go further in this direction. But uh, this was one, uh, one illustration that there is a link between a kernel and the function and the, 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 the properties of the function you learn. Uh, OK, so uh, let, me, uh, let me jump over a, a few slides and perhaps come back later. But uh, you know, for the moment, it was quite, uh, quite general. So this is for vectors. Let's see, for example, uh, in practice, how you can use the same ID. I, I will perhaps come back to this later, OK? But uh, the, next, the next part is about a real application, uh, about uh, learning uh, some, an application in computational biology. So at least I will talk a bit of, of computational biology. So it's a, it's a problem where here we want to, to do some machine learning, some statistics, uh, regression, or classification from very high dimensional data. And in particular, we want to work on some data like this that, for those of you working in, uh, in computational biology, are very familiar. Uh, these are what's called expression data. So 
In short, these are measures that nowadays we are able to make, so on, on, on a biological sample, like in, in, in your blood, or in, a, in my case, it would be more in a cancer tumor. Uh, so imagine that these are just matrices, okay? Imagine that a column here corresponds to one sample. So I will focus on an application which is in cancer diagnosis or in cancer prognosis, so meaning that uh, someone comes to the hospital with a cancer, breast cancer in this case, uh, in most cases, if it's early enough, there is some surgery that is done to remove the, the tumor. And then there's a very important question, which is that sometimes the person is cured forever, so it's, uh, it's done, okay, uh, we can, the person can live a happy life. And unfortunately, in some cases, uh, the, the, the cancer can, uh, can relapse a few years later, in two years, three years, five years, etc., with a new cancer that is often much more difficult to cure than the first one, because it will be less localized and more resistant to, to therapies. Okay, so there is this uncertainty of what's going to happen in the future and predicting what's going to happen in the future is called the question of prognosis. Can you predict what will be the evolution of a disease? Uh, and in this case, uh, so I said sometimes it relapses, sometimes it does not. And we know that we have some drugs, in particular chemotherapies, that can be used in order to reduce the risk of relapse. On the other hand, the chemotherapies are very toxic. So if you can, if you give chemotherapy, there are many secondary effects. Uh, it can sometimes lead to very bad side effects. So as much as possible, you would like not to give too much chemotherapy. But if you estimate that the risk of relapse is high, you should give aggressive chemotherapy to reduce the risk of relapse. Okay? And therefore, uh, to make the decision of the, of the treatment to give or not, it's very important to be able to predict whether you know, a person with a cancer at time T uh, may or may not relapse within five years, for example. So this has become like a, you know, a very important problem uh, attacked by many statisticians and machine learning people, uh, because in particular, to make this prediction, now we can make measurements uh, over the, the, the tumor that was uh, taken by surgery. And these numbers here that you can imagine on, on the column are what's called the, the activity or the expression of all the genes uh, which are in, in the human body, so in the, in the, in the, in the sample. And roughly speaking, we have 20, 20,000 genes. So we can measure simul simultaneously 20,000 numbers to characterize a biological sample. And so to make a long story short, the, the, the machine learning problem is I have, I have vectors in 20,000 dimensions, which are the 20,000 genes. And I want to predict from a training set of, of like uh, 200 patients that I saw five years ago, and I know that <coughs> Within five years, some had a cancer that relapsed and some did not. I want to make a prediction, so to learn a model to try to relate the risk of a lapse to the, these 20,000 numbers. Okay? So in a sense, it's a standard uh, learning problem, but it's, it's characteristic of these high-dimensional uh, problems with limited amount of training data. N is not very large, and P is quite large. So you can apply any machine learning tool here, and most of them have been tried. Uh, and, but if you want to, you know, to be, uh, to try to think how can we, so it works to some extent, but uh, uh, there is a common belief that the, the, the performance that we, that we have nowadays is not the optimal one because, uh, in particular, it has been shown that when you increase the number of samples, so there's been a few studies where instead of hundreds, we have a thousand or five thousand samples, we see that the performance continues to increase, whatever method you use. So, we know that in terms of learning, we, we have not reached yet the, the asymptotics of what you could reach if you had more samples. So it makes sense, you know, given that we don't have so many samples, it will make sense to try to improve the methods, machine learning methods or statistical methods, to try to improve the performance because probably we did not reach the best we, can, we could do if we had more samples. And so, for example, an idea that, that, uh, you, know, that you could try is to say, well, uh, I have 20,000 numbers, so the 20,000 uh, features which characterize my sample. But in fact, uh, we know a lot of things about these, uh, these, uh, these, uh, these numbers because these 20,000 numbers, they measure the activity of 20,000 objects, which are the genes. And in biology, the genes are like you know, players that can play together to, to do things. And so in particular, what we know, so it's independent from the measurements, but we know that the genes interact with each other. Okay, so we have this, this kind of networks. These are two networks, independent networks, which you have to think in terms of each network here. Let's say the, the, the right network here. Uh, it's a graph where the nodes are the features. Okay, so this is a graph with the 20,000 genes over the graph. 
And there is some information. You see there are some edges between two, two genes. When we know that the two genes can, in this case, can interact with each other, so roughly speaking, they, they, they can interact in order to do something together. Okay? So mathematically, this means that uh, this is a case where we have a high dimensional problem. We have 20,000 dimensions. Okay? But in addition to that, we have a network or a graph that describes us how the 20,000 dimensions can work together or not. So the natural question is, instead of just working, uh, doing regression in 20,000 dimensions, can I use this prior knowledge, this graph here, in order you know, to reduce the complexity of the task and to make the learning easier? How, how could I use that? So how could you use that? Well, there are many ways to, you could imagine, but let's try to, 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 to use uh, you know, kernel methods, in particular, this, uh, invent a kernel that would integrate the knowledge of this graph to do something useful. How could we do that? Well, an hypothesis we could make is, uh, suppose so, we have the data, we will restrict ourselves to learning a linear model. It's already you know, complicated enough, so we will make a linear model in dimension 20,000. But instead of just saying, Let's make a linear model regularized with a L2 norm of, of beta, which could work, but uh, you know, there is no knowledge here. What about changing here the, the, the penalty so that the, the model itself uh, would be more coherent with what we know about the genes? And more coherent typically could be that, uh, we, so we, we could say that uh, when we learn a linear model beta, we could try to impose that the weights of features which are connected to each other could be similar to each other. Like if we assume that two genes you know, interact to have a function, then you would expect them to have the same weight or similar weight in the model. Okay, so, so the kind of thing you could do is uh, you know, learn a model here, but try to change the L2 norm of beta by some other penalty which would encode some knowledge you have. And in this case, let's try to define a new penalty. So this is a new choice where instead of the Euclidean norm of beta, we look at all the interactions between feature i and feature j, so these are genes in our case. We look at the difference of, of the weight beta at i and j. We made the difference, we square it, and we made the sum over all interactions. Okay, so think of this as a variant of the L2 norm. Okay, instead of the L2 norm, we say, well, let's replace the L2 norm by something else that would include our prior knowledge. And here we would say, let's run a linear model that has a small omega of beta value, meaning that it will be smooth over the graph. Okay, it's, it's a way to, to smoothly reduce the, the dimension of the complexity of the problem. Now you could say, well, uh, what, what about trying to make a, a new algorithm to learn a model that minimizes the empirical risk that we have seen forever, and this new penalty here, which is something we just invented, okay? Well, if you do that, then in fact, you can show that Doing that corresponds to choosing a particular kernel. And, and more precisely, uh, perhaps the, the next slide is a, bit, uh, is a bit ugly, so let's not look at all the details, but given all that we have seen already, this theorem says that, roughly speaking, if you learn, so if you want to learn a model, okay, uh, this is your empirical risk, is a standard one, and you learn a model with this penalty, so we just invented this penalty, then it's equivalent to learning simply a linear model with L2 regularization in some new feature space. Okay, so it means that when I, when I want to use the penalty sum of beta i minus beta j square, this is formally the same as learning a model with L2 penalty, but in a different space. Okay, it's not directly on the 20,000 dimensional vectors. I need to change the space and do L2 regularization is the same. And, yeah? Is it something related to manifold learning? Sorry? Is it related to manifold learning, this idea? Yeah, it's related to manifold learning, yeah. So, the, I mean, uh, yeah. In particular, you see graph Laplace and et cetera, so there are, there are similar things, yeah. But so here, so, uh, so in order, here I say, learning with this penalty is equivalent to learning with L2 penalty in a new space, okay, in the space of phi of x, and the inner product in the new space which we call a kernel for us, is simply obtained by multiplying your 20,000 dimensional vectors, x and x prime, 
but not directly because otherwise it would be just the standard inner product, it would be L2 penalty. You multiply them with, in the middle, a matrix, which is a particular matrix called pseudo inverse of the graph Laplacian. So whatever that means, let, let's, so this is just a matrix, okay? For example, if, uh, if you give me this graph, I have a way to compute a matrix called the Laplacian and to compute this matrix L star, okay? I will not explain uh, in detail how you compute that, but it exists, so give me a graph. In two lines of MATLAB, you can compute this, this matrix here, okay? And so the take home message is that you start from the graph, you compute this, this matrix, and then you use this matrix to define a new inner product here, meaning that given two expression vectors, so two vectors of, of you know, x and x prime of dimension 20,000, you compute x transpose this matrix transpose x prime. This gives you a number. I claim that this thing is a kernel, so it's a, it's a valid positive effect kernel. And in fact, when you use this kernel and learn the SVM or whatever with this kernel, it's equivalent to learning a linear function with this penalty here. Okay? So this is an example where, again, you know, we, in a sense, we said, let's, let's, want, let's learn something and directly decide what we want to penalize. Here I said perhaps we could try to penalize this sum of beta i minus beta j square. It may work, it may be useful or not, but at least this is the constraint we do. And in fact, so uh, yeah, I started from the penalty and derived the kernel. You see that there is, it's often systematic, there is often a way, given a penalty, to build the kernel that induces this penalty. And in this case, this is a very, it seems to be strange, uh, it's, a, it's just a kernel that, that transforms the inner product by introducing a, a, a matrix called the pseudo-universe of the Laplacian, whatever it means. Okay, but again, uh, what's important is not what's this matrix, it's just that if you use this operation, then it corresponds to this penalty. So, you know, the, the, the message here is that if you have some prior knowledge or prior idea of what you would like to penalize, like here I would like my linear model to be coherent with this graph according to this definition, there may be a way to deduce a kernel, in this case this kernel, such that just using this kernel in your SVM does the job of penalizing this. It's a bit similar to this Gaussian kernel, the mean kernel, which are related to some penalty. Okay, so this allows you, uh, if you look at, at the right picture here, this, this is typically, so here we use this network in the training phase as prior knowledge, so we started from data and the network. We use the network to define a kernel, then using this kernel we make a SVM to learn a linear model. Uh, it's a linear model, so we have, at the end we have a weight for each gene, and we can map back the weights to the graph in order to check if we can interpret the, the, the model. And here on the right, uh, so the, the, there is a, a color code between uh, uh, green and red to, 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 to show negative and positive numbers. And what you see is that uh, on, on the right, the, the, the model you have learned is very coherent with the network. Like you have regions of the network which are rather green, some other rather red. So here you can start to get some interpretation of what you have learned, not in terms of individual genes, but in terms of areas or regions in the network. Okay, so you see that you have you have, in a sense, reduced the dimension because there is a notion of averaging, etc. So it, it's all smooth, it's not strict uh, dimension reduction, but in a sense, you, you, instead of learning 20,000 independent weights, you constrain them to be coherent uh, with each other. And this is very different from the last picture, which is just a standard SVM with L2 regularization, uh, where each, uh, once you plot back the model on the graph, you see very uh, little coherence, like you have red genes and green genes. Uh, so it's hard to say whether this region plays a role in the risk of relapse of cancer. Okay, so it's helpful for interpretability. And it, it can, even though in this case it's not easy, but it can be helpful for prediction performance too. Like it's a way to, to reduce the complexity of the learning task. Okay, so, uh, so, so just if you're interested in this kind of network, in fact, uh, I, I took a, a particular case of, of a penalty that's related to a kernel, but wh when you start playing with the graph Laplace, et cetera, you can deduce many other kernels, like here instead of taking this pseudo inverse of the graph Laplacian, and for those of you who've heard of manifold learning, et cetera, you can take any you know, spectral transform of the Laplacian, like something called the diffusion kernel, is a good way also to uh, to penalize, uh, so to make a new kernel in order to learn a function, and then the penalty 
it's not directly this thing, but it's more related to Fourier transform of the graph. So it would be a long story, but let's say that you can do Fourier transform of your graphs and deduce graph kernels that allow you to control the regularity of a function of our graph, not only in terms of its increments, but also in terms of its Fourier coefficients, just like the Gaussian kernels on the, on the real uh, vector space. OK. So uh, in the time remaining, uh, I will, um, unfortunately, you have to be a bit, a bit fast on, on many different things. I would just mention that, uh, going back to the previous section, so there, there are topics that I, uh, I will not cover here, which are how to make kernels on, on objects which are not vectors. Like here, I just talked of vectors, uh, like the, the Gaussian kernel and the Laplace kernel, the mean kernel. These are all, uh, all kernels for, uh, for vectors, which are standard objects. Now, I promised at the beginning of the course that uh, kernels also allowed you to, to do regression or SVM on data which are not directly numbers, which are like time series, images, text, etc. So there is uh, this big topic of how to make kernels for non-vector objects, like in, so in biology, but this is very similar in natural language processing. Sometimes you have data which are texts. So this text here, this is not English or French. This is a biological language. These are sequences of amino acids. So these are sequences of proteins, OK? And there are some machine learning problems where you have this text here, which are in one class, this text in some other class, and you want to make a model, to learn a model that's, uh, that allows you to discriminate between this class and this class. OK, formally, it's very similar to like a spam versus no spam classification. You have spams, you have no spams, and you want to, to make a discrimination based on that. So that's the case where, uh, but so one difference with the spam, no spam is that we are not very sure of what's the language here. There are no words, it's not obvious to, to use bag of words, et cetera. So the question, can we use SVMs or how could we use uh, linear models, rich regression on this data? In particular, can we use some things about the kernels to, to work on this kind of data? So there could be a long, you know, could spend an hour or more on this, but there is this question of how can we embed uh, the, the space of strings, for example, in a, in a feature space, so that we can then learn a linear model. And if possible, uh, is there something like, so does the kernel trick allow us to do things that we would not do explicitly? Like explicitly, you could do a bag of word representation, but perhaps there are things that you cannot do, like uh, corresponding to very high dimensional feature spaces that kernels allow you to do with that. And the answer is yes, there are things that with kernels you can do, uh, and which you could not do with an explicit mapping. Okay, so the kernel trick uh, can also work on strings. So just to give you two examples, uh, one of them is, is, uh, is what's called the spectrum kernel, or the mismatch kernel, or substring kernel. So the, the, you know, there are many papers on inventing kernels for strings. So there are this family of kernels where uh, you represent uh, you know, uh, a sequence like this. So suppose this is your text, x is your text. Then here you explicitly build a feature space. So it's a bit in the spirit of how to make features if we, if we believe that uh, we have some prior knowledge of what could be features important to solve your task. Then you could say, what are the features in my sequence or in my string that, that I should put in my feature space? And if you are in an application where you believe, for example, that the k so so the, the short sequences, uh, are important, then you could say, well, Let's represent a string by a vector that counts all the k-mers it contains, for example. So this could be a big space because if you have you know, 20 letters, all the k-mers uh, up to k equal 10. So if you look at all the sequences of, of 10 letters in an alphabet of size 20, dimension is already 20 to the 10. It goes quite quickly. So you can live in very high dimensional space. Now, if you think, uh, well, Instead of computing the vector, can I uh, use the kernel trick? So could I compute the inner product between the representation of two strings in this space? Then the answer is yes, and it can be done very efficiently. It's called the spectrum kernel. So more or less, you can, you can have a linear time uh, computation of kernels, meaning that if you give me two sequences, if, I, if you map them to this space of k and then compute the inner product, then you could do that directly by just making an algorithm that reads the first sequence, then reads the second sequence, and at the end it has computed the inner product. Okay, it's just based on enumerating the, the, the k-mers, storing them in a tree, and then adding some counters. So th this is a kind of you know, kernel tree that allows you 
to compute very efficiently some inner product in some space that could be very large. Okay, so this is called the spectrum kernel. Uh, now there are extensions um, that allows you also to represent a, a string by some k-mers up to mismatches or up to changes in, in the letters, etc. And there is a lot of, uh, of things that have been done in the field of kernels for that. Uh, and another direction that's completely different, uh, but in which case, uh, which does not correspond to some explicit feature space, so to some finite dimensional, is uh, something, for example, called the local alignment kernel. So this thing is more motivated by this notion of distance or similarity. Okay, so this thing may be a bit specific to biology. I mean, I, I don't know for other uh, texts, but if you ask a biologist, if you give a biologist two, two texts, so two proteins, and you, and you ask him, uh, are they similar or not? Uh, he would certainly not look at the, at the substrings it contains. Okay, it would not look at the k-mers. It, it would just tell you, well, it's very simple. You know, in biology, for the last... 30 years, we have defined a way to compare two sequences. And the way to compare is to find a, what's called an, an alignment, in that when you have two sequences, you need to align the letters on top of each other up to inserting some gaps in the two sequences. And we have defined a way to score the alignment. Okay, it's a, so in this case, it's called the smith waterman score. It has been published in 81, and it's used every day by all biologists uh, in the world uh, looking at this kind of data. <laughs> Okay, so, so when you want to make machine learning or statistics, instead of inventing a new representation of the data, you could also say, well, if this community is using this distance and has been using it for 20 years, it's probably because it encodes something that makes sense in terms of biology. Like the geometry defined by this notion of similarity may be the good one to represent the, the, the sequences in some space and then perhaps to do learning there. So naturally you could say, well, perhaps this thing could be used as a kernel directly. And then the motivation would be that we embed the strings in a space where the distance or the similarity is what the community thinks think is a good similarity. So here there is a, a, a small problem, which is that this score that is used by, uh, in biology is not a valid kernel, meaning that it's not positive definite. Uh, it doesn't have the, the properties. There is no reason it should have, you know, it's a, it's just a similarity measure that is used typically to find the most similar string to one string. So it's not a, a positive definite measure. So here you could, you could be a hacker and just say, well, I don't care. You know, I can still use it. And in my SVM, I will trick a few, a few parameters to make sure that I will learn something. And to some extent, you can do that. It works a bit. Another thing you can do is to try to say, well, can we change this notion of, of similarity into some other one that would be a valid kernel? Okay, and in this case, there is a way to transform the smith waterman score into some other score, which is a valid kernel, meaning it's, it's written in a product which you can use uh, without any uh, problem on any kernel method. Okay, uh, the trick here, uh, and it's quite a general trick, is to replace a max by a soft max. Uh, uh, there are other examples where this trick works, like there are different ways to, to you know, if those of you are working on edit distances, for example, when you compare two objects, sometimes the edit distance is the minimal number of operations to go from one to the other by a set of, of modifications. Then typically the, the, the edit distance is not positive definite, but if you instead average over all paths to go from here to there according to some ways, then you get some positive definite function. So this is what's used here. Replace the, the best alignment by the sum over all alignments weighted by their score, and this leads to a positive definite function. Okay? So uh, there are all, the, all these, uh, so technically, you know, uh, to show that it's positive definite, there is some theory, but uh, we skip that. Perhaps an important message to have in mind is that uh, I mentioned that there are many kernels around. Uh, if you compare, so you can use different kernels, it turns out that different kernels can lead to very different performance. So this is an, an old picture already, but um, that, that, you know, uh, so in biology, this is a case where we have a benchmark of sequence classification, and the goal is to design an algorithm that would classify sequences into categories, this guy called the scope categories, uh, and it be, it's become a benchmark in order to compare different algorithms. So here there are four curves. The, the higher, the better. You know, this just shows the, the performance of the different methods. And the four curves are were made by the same person with the same algorithm, the same implementation, SVM. The only thing that was different was the choice of kernel. 
Okay, everything else was similar. And by, by far, what you can see is that at least there, are, there seem to be quite significant differences in performance. Okay? So take on message, the choice of the kernel can have a, a very important impact on the final performance. It's not surprising, but we see it over and over. Okay? So it really makes sense to say, should I use this kernel or this kernel, or should I invent a new one? This can, this can have a huge impact in, in final performance, uh, the, the raw performance of your method. Okay? In this case, these are string kernels, so I just talked about two of them. One was the local alignment, which is that one, and one was the spectrum or mismatch, which, which is that one. So this is a case where we found that uh, for this application on protein, uh, the, 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 the kernel that worked the best, and perhaps the best way to make a kernel in this case, was the one using the, the, the similarity of the biologists. Okay, so the similarity that had been used for 20 years in biology, this is local alignment, turns out to lead to the best performance in classification. I'm not sure it's a general and, uh, statement and always true, but at least it makes sense to some extent that instead by yourself to invent new features and say perhaps a good way to classify your protein is to look at the, the k-mers, why not? Uh, perhaps it's a better idea to, to go to see experts and to ask them, well, you've been, you and your community has been investigating the sequences for years. What do you think is a good way to compare sequences? And uh, the answer could be either in terms of features, like you should look at this, this, or this, or in many cases, it could be just in terms of measuring similarities or distances. And with these, uh, the, the, with these kernels, you can either invent kernels based on features or based on distances, or even perhaps based on regularization. So this gives you like a, a toolbox that could be uh, useful to, to, to put some, some prior knowledge. Okay, uh, last word. So I skip that if you're interested. You can look at applications where instead of strings, you have graphs. So in, 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 in computational chemistries, we have many problems where we want to do classification of molecules. These are not strings, they are graphs. So Many people have developed also kernels for graphs. You can imagine you can apply that to other things, like some people have applied that to images, which you can represent as graphs and then do graph classification. Uh, I skip that. And perhaps I will just conclude with uh, an important part, which, uh, which I completely skip, but you can, uh, you can have a look at the slides, which is the notion of integrating uh, data, because, you know, I said there are many kernels, so obvious question is which one is a good one, and, and did we come up with a systematic way to choose the best kernel, or perhaps to combine the kernels, etc.? So the answer is partially yes. There are ways to combine kernels, and combining kernels could be also a way to combine heterogeneous data, if you have kernels corresponding to different kinds of data. So for example, you know, when you look at proteins, you can look at the sequence of the protein, or the structure, or the expression, etc. You could make a kernel for one or several kernels for each type of data. And the question is, can, we, can you learn jointly from all this data, like multi, uh, multiple types of data? So the, the, one, one take home message is that there are, there are two, two ways uh, to do that. One is oversimple, but it's very efficient. It's just when you have several kernels, you just make the sum of the kernels. Okay, you give me two kernels. K1 and K2, then you can make K1 plus K2. It's a valid new kernel. What does it do? Well, in terms of, perhaps in terms of features, so what is the space uh, in which you learn a linear model? You can think that when you make the sum of two inner products, it's just the inner product in vectors where you have concatenated the two, the two vectors. Okay, so it's as if you give me a set of features, a second set of features, you combine them together. In terms of kernels, it means you have kernel one, kernel two, you sum them together. Okay, so, uh, so okay, you can write it, but it's really a direct way to do data integration, which amounts to, to adding together kernels. And there are many cases where this is just what one possible application, where t you, know, you want to solve a problem where you have four types of different data. So it's again on biology. Here you want to predict interactions between proteins. You have data called expression, interaction, localization, phylogeny, etc. For each of them, you can make a kernel. Each individual kernel leads to some rock curve, so more or less good. And when you just do the sum of the four kernels and run a, sim a simple SVM, you get a much better performance. Okay, so this is really what you have to do if you think you have different kernels with like which, which are good, but which contain part of, the, part of the good things and you want to combine together all the good things together. It's really about you know, combining features. 
So, and it's surprisingly efficient in many cases. So if, if you don't know what to do, this is the thing to do. Just sum the kernels together uh, and, 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 and learn your model. Now, th there is also something quite popular. Uh, let's skip that. Uh, which is called learning the kernel. So another direction is, suppose you don't have two, but you have potentially thousands or millions of kernels, like you have many different kernels, many parameters. Is there a systematic way to learn a kernel? Uh, one ID, so I don't know if I have here, but there has been a one ID. Yeah, I don't know if it's there. Yeah, so there has been one idea to say that, well, if you have to, to, to invent a method to automatically tune parameters or learn a kernel, perhaps you need to define an objective function for a kernel. Okay? You have many possible kernels. If you define an objective function, then you can invent algorithms to optimize your objective function over the space of kernels. Could be linear combinations, could be uh, parametric forms, etc. So one objective function that has been proposed is exactly the, the value of the minimum of, of your learning algorithm. So remember, we do learning here by saying, if you give me one kernel, I look for a function that minimizes some empirical risk penalized by something. If you give me another kernel, I do the same. Now, if I want to compare the two kernels, perhaps the good way to look at is the value of the minimum. Okay? Perhaps it's not, but uh, at least uh, it's, it's one, cho one possible choice. In the Gaussian process world, it's completely different. In Bayesian setting, it would be different, but here, this is what has been proposed for kernel method. So to say that one way to assess whether a possible kernel is good or not is to look at the value of this minimum. Now it turns out, and it's not, not obvious from this equation, that seen as a function of the kernel, this number is a convex function of the kernel. Okay? Uh, meaning that if you give me uh, two matrices, two kernel matrices, I can solve two SVMs. Okay? I get two numbers at the optimal. And if you make a linear interpolation between the two kernel matrices, you get a sequence of numbers. And, and the value of the, of the, you know, if you plot the, the value of the minimum between the, uh, the two kernels, it would be co convex. Okay? So this thing is a convex function of the kernel. And therefore, it suggests that you can use this objective function in order to optimize something about kernels. And for example, so one popular um, method it's called MKL, multiple kernel learning. It simply says, well, if you give me 10 candidate kernels, then I can automatically learn a combination of them by saying, look at all convex combinations and pick the one with the smallest minimal value here. Okay? Uh, theoretically, it's a convex problem over the, the, the kernel, so you can solve it and find an efficient algorithm to solve that, so to find the best co convex combination. And what it does is that it tries to optimize the weight so that you, you end up with the best possible minimal value. And at the end, you obtain a, a new kernel, which is a combination of the kernels, uh, which is a kind of automatically optimized weighted combination trying to minimize this kind of stuff. Okay? It has been applied, and it works in some cases. Uh, and it, so it, it can work very well on some applications. So it's a, it's a quite convenient way to combine kernels. Now, I would just say that you have to be careful that uh, the, the, the main property of this MKL, so if you look at it closely, uh, is that it induces a new penalty. So if you think of it in terms of, you know, you have 10 different kernels, you do this MKL stuff to optimize linear combination. At the end, it will again minimize something over some space with some penalty. And we can study precisely what is the penalty. And the penalty is called a group lasso penalty, meaning that the, the main effect of multiple kernel learning is to do kernel selection, meaning that it will learn a linear combination of the kernel, but trying to push some of the weights to zero. Okay? It would be a bit long to explain in detail why, but this is just a conclusion of some, uh, some equation. So the take home message is that, uh, uh, do I have here? here? Yeah, the take-home message is that if, if you have 10 kernels and you believe none of them is completely wrong, it's just that they capture different aspects of your problem, then it's better just to make the sum of the kernels. You make the sum and you learn SVM with the sum. Now, if you have 100 kernels and you believe three of them are relevant and most of them are noisy and should not play a role, they just uh, decrease the performance, then you should use MKL that will do kernel selection 
So not only kernel combination, but kernel selection, and it would be, it would be very efficient to remove the effect of noisy kernels. Okay, that's the main difference between summing together kernels and doing MKL, uh, which is more related to kernel selection than, than really weighting the kernels together. Okay, uh, so I will stop here. I'm sorry, I, uh, I mean, I, I knew I had too many slides, but uh, there are many slides I didn't show. I think if you're interested in the topic, you can check the slides. Uh, there are many books, of course, many papers on kernel methods. I just tried, you know, today to give you some, uh, some idea of how we can uh, define kernels and more importantly, uh, you know, trying to highlight that to understand what is a kernel, you can look at the features, but you can also look at the, at the penalties which are induced. Uh, and at the end, you can come up with many kernels and, and the topic of how to integrate kernels is still widely open. I just mentioned you can sum the kernels, you can do MKL kind of stuff. But you know, it's not very clear why, for example, this, this number is a good objective function for kernels. You could invent other, other objective functions and derive new methods to combine kernels. Uh, you could also study uh, how to make new kernels for some specific data, uh, specific constraints you may have, like invariance by some, some, uh, uh, some operations, etc. So I would say the, the, the field is, is still widely open for any um, idea you may have. I stop here. Thanks for your attention, and if you have any questions, I don't know if we can take time, it's coffee time, but... So if there is one or two urgent questions, I can answer it, otherwise let's, uh, let's have coffee. One question, yeah? Yeah, so what is your expert advice on uh, selecting a kernel when you have 2.2 million feature data? When you have 2 million feature data? Yeah. Well, so, so if you have a kernel, so if we talk of kernel, the, the, the problem is not the, the dimension of the space. Okay, so if you have two million, like I have data with two million points, the SNP data. So when you, when you look at a, a genome, uh, one, one person is characterized by two million uh, numbers, which are the mutations in its DNA. Then from this, I can make several kernels. Like I could make the inner product, there are other ways to make kernels. I would say that uh, I would use either the sum kernel or the inner, or the inner product kernel. But it's not, you know, the, the dimension of the space is not itself a problem. And just to comment, so, you know, I don't know if Samia has more comment on that, but like we participated to challenges recently where you have a lot of heterogeneous data in, in biology, for example, you want to predict drug response uh, on patients based on genetic data, expression data, etc. And we found that in many cases, data integration, just doing the sum of a kernel over the genetics and a kernel over the expression and the kernel over clinical variables gives very good performance. So without much thinking, you, you end up with good uh, performance and data integration with that. Yeah. <coughs> so um, going back to the graph that we were talking about, it's a very dumb question, but does any spectral transformation to a regular graph to classing still hold to be a problem? You said you just apply any spectral transformation to the graph to classing. No, no, so it's a, it's a, it's, it's a, well, it's obviously a non-negative spectral transformation. So you need to transform, so mathematically, you know, I, I said you make a new inner product as X times the matrix times X prime. For it to be positive definite, you need this matrix to be positive definite. So eigenvalues have to be non-negative. Okay? So it's, it's always a positive thing. Kernel. Now, if you wanted to, to have some sense with respect to some regularization property of the network, then it makes sense to make a spectral transform of the Laplacian with not only a non-negative eigenvalues, but with also decreasing eigenvalues, so that you penalize more the, the, the high-frequency uh, content. Okay, so I think uh, it's already uh, late, so thanks a lot for your attention.